I'm a day late and a dollar short, but it's better than nothing. Oopsie, the worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Max back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. See, welcome into the worst wrestling podcast. I'm dropping a bonus episode, doing a quick review of AEW Forbidden Door. I might be a couple of days late with this review. Uh, Life finds a way, but hey, so do we. We're back, and we are uh, doing a quick review. We're going to smash through these because they had fucking 10 matches on this card, uh, which, you know, uh, being mostly a WWE viewer and with the five-card pay-per-views lately, 10 matches uh, definitely felt like a lot, Uh, but we'll get right into things. MJF. Versus Cachacero, Cachiero, Hatches. What was this fucking guy's name? Hatchacero. I finally figured it out. Um, he's a badass though. He looks really cool. Uh, he is a CMLL wrestler and legend. Uh, is Hatchacero, but MJF, the star of the show here, came out with the Long Island themed gear. I thought that was really cool. It was a really good match. I love MJF's throwback style. Uh, you know, Hatchacero was really cool and everything, but ultimately MJF goes over. And this was just a solid opening match, taking us right into the showrunner singer. Uh, if you hear the theme, the worst wrestling podcast, uh, the worst rapper alive, that is Max Caster of the Acclaimed. And so we had the Acclaimed and Tanahashi. Versus the Young Bucks and Okada. Bitch! So the crowd was chanting, uh, fuck him up, uh, when Okada was fighting Max Caster, which I thought was really funny. A lot of the crowd is solidly behind Okada. Uh, so I think that kind of tells you everything you need to know about, like, the ongoing storyline of just kind of quagmiring him with the Young Bucks and the Elite. I do think there is going to be potential for a big face turned down the road though because the crowd really loves okada um multiple times the crowd was uh you know chanting for okada ultimately okada goes over tanahashi uh with a rainmaker uh you know their long storied rivalry in njpw carrying over to aew uh but yeah ultimately the elite uh okada and the young bucks go over the acclaimed and then uh the only part, and I, I saw people kind of moaning about this online of uh, you had your big star Okada running away basically from 60-year-old Billy Gunn. But I got to say, 60-year-old Billy Gunn, uh, as quoted by Chris Van Vliet, looked fucking jacked. Okay, he didn't say fucking, but I'm saying he looked fucking jacked. Um, next up, kind of almost, this is where I feel like some of these matches didn't really make sense of why they were on the pay-per-view, especially with the way they're telling the story. And so we get into the first one, Brian Danielson versus Shingo Takagi uh, as part of the quarterfinals for the Owen Hart tournament. This just felt backwards because the whole thing of, uh, you know, we're supposed to, the winner of this match is going to face Pac on Dynamite, which feels more like a pay-per-view match like i'm assuming because brian danielson ultimately went over spoiler alert um so you would think like brian danielson versus pack is kind of a bigger deal on a pay-per-view whereas like i understand the idea behind this american dragon versus the rampage dragon i really like shingo takaga i thought this was a great match but this felt like this should have been on last week's dynamite and Pac versus uh, Brian Danielson should have been on Forbidden Door. But, you know, I understand because of the crossover, that's why they, they kind of shoved it in. And we're going to get Brian Danielson versus Pac now on uh, tonight, actually. I'm recording this on a Wednesday. 
Um, but yeah, American Dragon versus Rampage Dragon. I, the one thing I cannot stand, Aubrey Edwards. Oh my gosh, this woman drives me absolutely crazy. She is so overly performative in a role that requires like the complete opposite. Um, I think her name is Jessica Edwards, is the name of the female ref uh, in WWE. She is way better. Like, I don't even notice her in the ring. I, I'm pretty sure I'm even getting her name wrong, which is like, I know that sounds like a diss, but for a referee, it's like you were supposed to be incognito. It, you're supposed to be like the men in black. Like, I'm not supposed to, you're supposed to be like just relevant enough to fix everything and like keep everything in order, but just forgettable enough that I'm not focused on you. I'm focused on the fucking wrestlers in the ring. But Aubrey Edwards, my God, this lady is just out there making a show of herself. It drives me crazy. But like I said, it just kind of felt like a TV match. Um, and as much as I love Brian Danielson, this just felt unnecessary in terms of being on this card but it's still a fantastic match because i mean it's brian danielson uh and like this was my introduction to shingo takagi i had never seen him before i thought he looked awesome so i still really enjoyed the match for what it was next up and we're gonna pound right through a couple of these mina shirakawa versus tony storm for the aew women's title which this whole thing with Sasha Banks, a.k.a. Mercedes Monet. Uh, and I know she has, like, some sort of creative control uh, written into her contract. But this idea that, like, the the primary women's title is so far down the card, I don't know. It just feels off to me. But I love Tony Storm. Uh, her entrance was glorious. Came out with the Statue of Liberty get up. I thought that was amazing. Um, I even love uh, Taz. Uh, you know, on commentary, trying not to get canceled because he kept calling it. He was like, uh, a, he was calling it a fisherman suplex, but he's like, wait, no, it's a, it's a fisher person suplex. I was like, oh my god! But ultimately, Tony Storm wins, and we get the three way kiss with her, Mina, and Mariah May, uh, kind of uniting them all on one front. So maybe that's yet another AEW faction that we'll have to deal with. We will have to wait and see. We get into Orange Cassidy versus Zack Sabre Jr. Uh, I mean, I really love Orange Cassidy. It does feel like the shtick has kind of run its course a little bit. But I, I like this sort of reimagining that they're at least trying to tell in the wake of him losing... Um, you know, you had Statlander and the best friends all... Uh, well, the one got injured and the other one turned on him. Um, but like after kind of losing his family, it seems like he's trying to take things more seriously and obviously still has remnants of the comedy gimmick, which are kind of like, you know, personal power ups almost. Um, but yeah, no, Zack Sabre Jr. is just fucking literally one of the best wrestlers in the world. And he showed why in this match. Uh, it was a solid match, but yeah, Zack goes over and then. This was like, I, I again, I don't understand why this is on the card, why we needed 10 matches, and this had to be one of them. Samoa Joe, Hook, and Shibata versus Learning Tree, Chris Jericho, Big Bill, and Jeff Cobb. Again, I, I just was like, I don't, I frankly don't understand why this is on a pay-per-view. Like, this is very much a TV match. Um, literally, the crowd is chanting, please retire and i look credit to jericho for really like trying to apply this gimmick as a heel grabs the mic and says yo you guys don't want me to retire i'm the hometown hero and they mention on commentary because his dad uh played for the rangers and he grew up in the area and papa bro nobody gives a fuck when you're getting please retire chance and it's not in an ironic way like you have go away heat and there's actually, a, there's multiple characters I feel like in AEW, at least for me, that have go away heat. Like, I just don't need to see these guys on my television in a weekly format. And Chris Jericho's one, and the other one I can think of right off the top of my head is Don Callis, who also made a fucking appearance on this show. Um, but ultimately, uh, 
the thing with AEW is like every match is good. It's like that's fine. That part is almost like irrelevant. Like the work rate and the wrestling itself is almost always quality. I I will give credit where credit is due. But this just was not a relevant match. But Hook ultimately wins with a a Judas effect that he kind of modifies. Uh, where he uses the point of his elbow, so it does look a little bit cooler, but it is funny that he stole Jericho's move and uh, and beat him with it. Um, but yeah, it, this this match was basically fucking irrelevant. I don't even know why it was on the card. Um, but then, now we get into the real shit. This was an awesome match. A vacant uh, TNT uh, title ladder match featuring Mark Briscoe, Kanosuke Takashita, Dante Martin, El Fantasma, Leo Rush, and Jack Perry. And, you know, aside from the main event, this was my favorite match on the card by far. Um, you know, Jack Perry uh, was being anointed as the uh, TNT uh, champion, but ultimately it led to the ladder match. And so, you know, they all are attacking Perry um, you know, Kanosuke is quick. Uh, sorry, they all attack Jack Perry and they all attack Kanosuke Takashi because he's the biggest man in the match. They're quick to bring in the ladders. Uh, Jack Perry spends a lot of the match trying to be sneaky using heel tactics, which I love. Uh, Leo Rush, man, Leo Rush is like a performer, in ring performer. He is so good. He actually reminds me of uh, uh, Demarius Johnson from MMA Mighty Mouse. You remember that guy? Uh, just kind of the size and the style and uh, but like the also like the big hitting capacity like man yeah Leo Rush kind of reminds me of that um, but also was taking crazy bumps in this match like uh, a EVP at one point puts him through the ladder Dante Martin uh, took a brain buster on the side of the ladder which I thought was sick uh, Briscoe hit a somersault off a chair to the outside on Takashita who was sandwiched in between a ladder and a table. So that was a really killer spot. Uh, Briscoe uh, also trying to hit Jack Perry from the ladder on the edge of the ring. Pulls a Copeland where he like, uh, basically he had the ladder set up on the side of the ring uh, and then kind of tried to jump almost across over the turnbuckle to hit Jack Perry through the table, but like didn't quite make it. And so, like, the table didn't even break. It was, he landed very much like Adam Copeland did. So he's lucky that he didn't get hurt, fortunately. Um, but that was, like, a crazy spot. Uh, Takashita, at one point, power bombs Leo Rush through the ladder and then hits a blue thunder bomb uh, to EVP on the tables outside. So, like, just crazy spots all over. Um, Perry eventually, uh, Jack Perry eventually kills uh, Briscoe with a ladder and a chair, and uh, he actually steps over him to climb up and win and secure the TNT title. Uh, so, like I said, this was easily my favorite match of the night, besides, like I said, the main event. And man, we still got great, still got three matches left. Jesus Christ, okay. Uh, so we get Stephanie Vaker, Vacker versus Mercedes Monet. For the NJPW Strong TBS title, because basically they're going title for title. So you have Stephanie Backer is the NJPW Strong Women's Champion. You have Mercedes Monet is the TBS AEW Women's Champion. They're going title for title. And I don't know if this is something that they're going to continue, but at least for the night... This was Mercedes Monet like turning heel in New York City. Uh, I know it's probably because of like the Boston affiliation, and so I, I wonder if she's just gonna go with being heel in New York and then try to go back to being a babyface everywhere else. I think that would be a huge mistake, especially because obviously. So just to get to the end of the match, it was a really solid match. Mercedes Monet does end up going over. She hits the the Monet Maker, whatever the fuck her the name of her new finisher is. A pretty sweet looking finisher, I will say. Uh, the way she does like the the gory bomb, but then like flips it to the side. I kind of like it. I'm not gonna lie, but she hits her finish. She ends up going over. She's now double champ. Uh, but we get the return of 
DMD Britt Baker stepping on her moment. And, you know, obviously, anytime you have, like, a big star returning, usually you get, like, the big face pop. I feel like they should run with this. They should run with this double turn of having Britt Baker continue in a face turn. And she should be the baby face, really. And Mercedes Monet should really be the heel. I do think if the crowd responds that way, Mercedes, to her credit, I do think will adopt the heel mentality pretty quickly. I don't think she's so stubborn that she would try to position herself as a baby face, like against another person who's clearly getting a big baby face reaction and, and she's getting the heel. I think she loves even playing the heel. So I would hope that we see that sooner rather than later, because even people lamenting about her promo work, like, yo, Mercedes Monet is a decent promo as a heel. As a baby face, it's fucking horrendous. I hate hearing that shit. This hopeful fucking, oh, we're the best wrestling. This is where the best wrestlers wrestle. I I can't stand that shit. Make her a fucking heel and let her just be super cocky and arrogant. She'll drop killer promos. Uh, so second to last, the semi-main event, we get John Maxley versus NATO for the IWGP title. And we get uh, Red Shoes as referee, uh, the significance of which pointed out by commentary. Red Shoes, essentially the Earl Hebner of NJPW, is he's basically the most senior referee. Uh, but yeah, it was a great match. The one thing I will say is I, I thought this was a really surprising finish. The fact that NATO ended up going over John Moxley, I think it's because they're telling the story of, you know, and they told the story really through commentary, and that's that's fine. But it's like the amount of times I've said now that they were telling the story through commentary, it's like, okay, but if you're live, you don't hear the commentary. So it's like you just have to know what's going on. Uh, me being a television viewer, luckily, like I get the backstory, but ultimately that backstory is that NATO had been, you know, really embarrassed by losing to a foreign champion, not only losing the championship, but losing it on, on foreign soil in America. Um, so to be able to go to America and reclaim his title against the big bad American uh, was uh, sort of like the redemption character arc for when he now goes back to NJPW and continues that story. And they could always flip it back to Moxley, um, you know, if they decide to. That's a thing where I feel like, at least with AEW and some of these other companies, they're not afraid to kind of flip their titles around a little bit um, so that you can get these multi-time because you're like moxley can't be a multi-time uh iwgp title if he never loses the title so he could just as easily win it back from naito maybe they set that up at wrestle kingdom which is just around the corner honestly i'm not really sure what they're gonna do but um i i honestly i thought john moxley was gonna come away with this i thought i was pretty locked locked in even uh but apparently i was wrong um, cause NATO, your new IWGP champion. And finally, whoo, man, we slammed through 10 matches in 18 minutes or nine matches, I guess in 18 minutes. That's not too bad, but we get to the main event of the evening. The whole reason I even wanted to do this, I wanted to be able to give some positive praise and some flowers to AEW. Um, since I started this channel, not that it's really relevant or that anyone gives a shit, but the highest viewed video I had was basically talking about AEW's problems and shitting on them a little bit. I do think that happens a lot, and I think there's this perception sometimes of like, oh, well, you're a WWE fan or you're a this fan or whatever, whatever. It's like, look, I just love good wrestling. I don't really care what the letters on the company are. I just want good storytelling. I've always thought AEW had incredible matches in terms of just like the pure work rate, but I, I, what I want, you know what I want is I want the storytelling of WWE, maybe not to the same degree. Cause obviously, you know, you're limited by your production, but I'm saying like, I just want congruent long running 
storylines mixed with the work rate. That's what I want. And, you know, when AEW really came about, we were kind of promised that of like they were going to follow the actual sports rankings and treat it more of like in kayfabe, treat it more like a sport. And that was supposed to help support some of these storylines. And that really, I feel like, has gone away since their inception. But this is a way to bring it back. And it was Will Ospreay versus Strickland Swerve for the AEW Championship, the Big Daddy. You had Ospreay come out with the Hayabusa gear. You had uh, Swerve was introduced by local legend and rapper Jim Jones. They both get huge reactions. Little bit of ninja moves to start, but they didn't do it crazy like Ricochet. They did it in a way where, I mean, it's not believable in the sense of a fight, but it's believable in the in the realm of professional wrestling. I thought they did really well with that. And then they get into some cool spots right off the bat. You get uh, Osprey hit a Hurricane Rana off the off the barricade where they were both, uh, you know, standing on the edge of the barricade balanced. I thought that was really cool. Um, the You had this one point where, uh, and I, again, this is like either you love AEW style wrestling or you fucking hate it. And this was definitely, I could see you being on either side of this one. But basically, um, Osprey goes for an os cutter and Swerve kind of jumps off. So if if Osprey is going off one side of the ring at 90 degree angle, Swerve jumps off those ropes and he's able to counter and basically hit a stomp while Osprey an os cutter. It looked pretty fucking cool. I'm not gonna lie. Like again, it's the kind of shit almost like you see in like movie choreography and if done improperly can look really shitty in a wrestling ring. I'm, I feel like they pulled it off. That's my personal opinion. I thought the move looked cool as fuck. <laughs> the only thing that looked cooler than that was uh swerve at one point climbed up uh, the, uh, to the top rope and hit a fucking stomp to Osprey uh, on the outside, like from the top rope, hit him with the stomp and it like hit him on the announce table and it looked fucking sick so that was like a, a sweet move um and then osprey at one point uh hits the os cutter into the storm breaker for a near fall uh you know even though he had swore that he wasn't going to use it uh telling the story of trying to use the tiger driver 91 that injured brian danielson because at this point he's doing anything he can to win the title um you know uh, uh and then you had swerve using the hidden blade and they're like both countering each other in like all these crazy ways. Um, but at one point you get the ref bump and then this is where shit just goes fucking sideways. And it's like, look, I'm not going to give AEW the pass any more than I would WWE. And I have always said, I hate, I hate, I hate, especially on a pay-per-view when you have a fucking killer match that just, you know, to the the idea of you got to protect a guy by just having a bunch of chicanery and bullshit happen on the outside. Uh, but basically, Don Callis comes uh, down to the ring and he tries to give Osprey a screwdriver, um, but he won't use it. And then uh, Prince Nana like pushes down Don Callis, and Osprey goes to threaten Nana. He's you know he's threatening him with the screwdriver, but then he kind of like. He, he does the, the out-of-body experience almost of, like, he's looking at himself like, what am I doing? This isn't me. And he throws away the screwdriver. And then, uh, you know, he goes back in the rain. And he gets fucking smoked, just gets stomped and pinned. He kicks out. But then uh, uh, Swerve hits him with this, like, nasty-looking arm breaker. House call. Kick out again. Oh, you think for a second, but then one more house call into a beat crusher and Swerve Strickland is still your AEW champion. And it was a great match in spite of the bullshit. I liked the finish. I, I do understand that they want to protect Osprey. I don't feel like with the finish, the way that they did the finish, you could have just done it. You could have done that same finish without all the bullshit with Don Callis, frankly. I felt like that was unnecessary and unneeded, but it wasn't like so much that I was like, oh no, and it like really fucked fucked up the end of the match. So ultimately, 
uh, you know, is an entertaining pay-per-view, a really fantastic main event. I'm sure there's people that'll say, oh, it's match of the year. Bro, we're in fucking, uh, we're just starting July. Um, I'm, I'm going to wait before, because there's, you know, Wrestle Kingdom is just around the corner. We got uh, All In and Wembley is just around the corner. So there is a lot of great AEW pay-per-views coming up. And hopefully I'll do more of these bonus review videos uh, coming up. But until then, and until the next time, I will catch all of you guys on the flip side. My positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never polarize on raps. I'm never primitive, but animalistic, vicious. Characteristics, hereditary potency, epicetic means, yo. Ever the HMCs at extraordinary speed. Some of the ideas like, some of the razor blues and grease in your bare feet.